Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, it's just great to, to uh, see so many people. And, and I will, I'm going to talk a lot about this picture. And uh, please, as we go along, you know, if there's, if there's a burning question, ask it. And, and because there are so many uh, uh, founders of what I'm going to talk about in this picture, I want to present to you in the audience. If I can't answer it, one of them can. So, uh, so let's, get, let's get started. Um, so what is this a picture of? This is, uh, this, this and, and behind the writing, of course. This is a picture of, of the universe looking out. And uh, here's a, a, a prop. This is the beach ball. This is uh, what you would see. So that's just the universe rolled out flat on a map. And we'll talk about this red ring later. But that's what you see if you look at the universe in microwaves in microwave radiation, and we'll come back to what that means as well. You can think of it as a heat map of the universe. And, and uh, from the bluest blue there to the reddest red is about 400 millionths of a degree C, okay? So it's a, it's a, it's a cool, it's a very cold heat map, but it's, it's like a heat map of the universe. And in the, in the way we think about it, and we'll talk about it, this is, actually, this is an image of the birth of the universe. And what those splotches, and, and again, we'll, we'll get to them, what those are telling you, what, what they arise from in, in most of the models, is, is from quantum mechanical fluctuations at, at the birth of the universe that are now writ large across the sky. And they're also, and again, we'll keep coming back to this, they are the seeds for the formation of all the structure in the universe. So all the galaxies that we see, and the clusters of galaxies and, and stars and eventually planets came out of, of these seeds that this picture traced out. So I will, uh, because I've been working on this for so long, I'll, I'll probably slip into saying CMB at times, when I, that stands for the Cosmic Microwave Background. And that's this, okay? That's the stuff we're studying. So if I just use those initials, just, just think about that. And the other thing I, I want to emphasize is I'm going to be as conservative as possible in that I'm not, not going to speculate too much about wild things. And I want to stick to what's measured, okay, what we can know. And so when you leave, you don't have to worry about, is that really true or things like that, right? So I, I, I want to stay close to that. Okay, so one of the hard things about thinking about the universe is, is getting your head around how big it is. Okay, and, and it, is, it is, of course, it's really big. It's the whole universe, right? And to, uh, to set that, right, so the moon, the moon is about 240,000 miles away, okay? So it's about a light second away. And so if you have a good car, you can drive to the moon, right? And if you have a Volvo, you can drive back, right? So anyway, the moon's, the moon's sort of this accessible distance that we can all, that we can all get to. <laughs> So the sun is uh, eight light minutes away, right? So that means when we look at the sun and something happens on it, we don't see it for eight light minutes. If it disappeared, you know, even, even the effects of gravity propagate at the speed of light. If it disappeared, we wouldn't know it for eight minutes. Okay, and taking the, the next step up, the center of our galaxy. So here's a picture of the galaxy. And uh, this is taken by the, uh, uh, by the Derby instrument aboard the COBE satellite. So this was the, the instrument that took lots of beautiful images of the sky but, but didn't win the Nobel Prize. So the other two instruments were for, I'll, I'll show you what they were involved in later. But that is a picture of our galaxy, the Milky Way, in an infrared emission. And so, of course, we are part of the Milky Way. This is this, you know, our dinner plate of stars. And so this would be like, you know, if you're in the greater New York area, if you're driving up the New Jersey Turnpike and you look at Manhattan, right, there's, there's Manhattan and there's everything else, right? So, so this is, so th anyway, so the, we're on the outskirts of this. We're about two-thirds of the way out from the center. And, and that's what we see looking, looking back towards the center of the galaxy. So, and, the, and the center of the galaxy there is 25,000, about 25,000 light years away. Okay, so that means... Right, if you want to have a conversation with somebody who is near the center of the galaxy, right, it's a long, com it's a long conversation. Right? It's, you say, you probably, hopefully they send something to you, you hear them, 
you say hi, you send them a message back, they get it, 25,000 years, you know, 25,000 years, 25,000 years, you know, how's the weather, whatever, right? And, and uh, so that's, but that's how to think about it, right? It's really far away, right? In our galaxy, so, in, and we'll keep coming back to thinking about how far away things are. In our galaxy, there are about 100 billion stars. So there are a couple of numbers you should remember. 100 billion is one of them. Um, a, another one is, uh, you should all leave knowing the age of the universe if you don't know it already. It's, uh, it, this is 100 billion, it's measured in billions of years. It's about 13.8 billion years, which we'll, which we'll get back to. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the picture, a good way, a, a way to remember this. There are many ways to remember this number. It's the number of neurons in our brains. Or more, maybe more visual, if you have a sweet tooth, if you took 50 cubic meters and filled it with M&Ms, that's about 100 billion M&Ms, okay? So just to, to put it in perspective. Okay, so this is hopefully running. It is running. This is an uh, image, a movie, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And, and this is not a simulation, okay? These are all galaxies. And they're all measured, and, and you, there they are. And this model that, that we'll talk about, and this is, this is just, I just love this animation, or this movie, right? It's often, it's put it on late at night, and turn down the lights, and imagine flying through, right? And, and, uh, and this is the universe like it is around us now. Okay, this is, this is relatively nearby. The edge, if you go to the very edge of, of, this, of this group, it's about 1.3 billion uh, light years away. And, and there are, in this particular one, there are about 400,000 uh, galaxies. And right, all, each of those, sort of on average, has about 100 billion stars in it, okay, to, to give you the scale. And this is the scale where we start to think about uh, where we start to, start to think about cosmology. And the thing I want to impress about this model is we, of, of cosmology that we have is that we are we, in the large. We don't understand in detail how these form. It's a huge open question, and, and, and I'll show you lots of things we don't understand. But in the large, we can sort of have a, have a good outline of how we got from this picture to that picture. Good. So let me let's jump to another picture of of galaxies. This is this is called the Hubble <laughs> Ultra Deep Field, and it's another beautiful image. Um, this this goes this goes out to uh, to uh, even uh, many more light years away, and these also, except for the ones with uh, with the stars around them, these are also galaxies. These are also all galaxies, each of them with about 100, uh, you know, 100 billion stars. And the thing is, this image is a 50th the size of a full moon. Okay. So you can just go in there, and if you count them up, right, obviously with a computer, there are about 10,000 galaxies in there. Okay. And then you can ask, how many of those fit on the whole sky? And the number again is 100 billion. Okay, so there, and there, so there are about again 100 billion, on average, stars in the galaxy, and 100 billion galaxies. And this looks out to the edge of the observable universe, and we say there are about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Okay, so now I want to focus on what that means um, um, in the next few slides. And when we look at these, these are rushing away from us. Okay? These, yeah, there they are. We look out. We look, as long as we look far enough away, these, these are, are all rushing away from us. Okay. So that means we just we look at that, and the, uni the universe is expanding. This isn't, this isn't made up. I mean, this is a fact, right? The universe is expanding. And, and so let's see what that, we'll, we'll get into this and see what this means. But the, uh, 
And, and what Hubble observed was, uh, he actually look, took a combination of other people's observations and put them on a plot. Uh, well, but what he found was that the further a galaxy is away from us, the faster it's moving, okay? So if it is twice as far away, it's moving twice as fast. That's what, these, uh, that's what the size of these arrows are supposed to be, right? It's three times further away, it's moving three times as fast. And you might think that, uh, you know, that makes us, of course, we're special, but we're not that special. And in this picture, any observer in the universe sees the same thing. And, and let me try to, to uh, motivate that. And uh, so I have my prop here. These are uh, lots of props here. Here. Apologies to you on the, on the side. These are galaxies, okay? Right, so here. One will have uh, six galaxies, I think six galaxies, right? Okay, so now, so what does the expansion of the universe look like? It's just like adding carpet, but adding floor between these galaxies, okay? So let's just, and we, have, we add the same amount of floor everywhere. It is those who say in the bottom, we're making space. It's, that's a nebulous, Physically, it's a nebulous thing, but it's a great way of thinking about the expansion of the universe. And if you just make space of the same amount between every one of them, well, that moves that much, that has to move twice as far. That moves that much, that has to move three times as far, two twice as far, and three times as far. And you get the expansion, right? But no matter which cup you were on, right? Imagine this goes on forever, right, in the two directions. No matter which cup you're on, you see the same picture. So it's expanding, but there is no preferential center, okay? As long as it goes on forever, right? All you're doing is making space and taking it away, okay? That's, it, and so it's absolutely, it is not like a firecracker going off in a pre-existing space, right? It really is like you are making space, and that's a, and you want to keep that in mind. It's like space becomes the currency, okay? And will, and and that notion will keep coming back. I, I won't put these back by the drinking fountain, okay? So, um, I, so I don't know if that's uh, if anyone has any questions on that. To help, is that we're good there? Okay, yeah. You observe that with the um, infrared shift, or how? how did you yes, exactly. This is the, with 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 red shift. Exactly. You really get the picture. I mean, yeah. if you had a rubber band, and there were little dots on the rubber band, and then yeah. you just stretched it in half, it doubled its length. Well, the dots yeah. that were close together would have moved a distance, but the dot at this end would have moved a whole lot further. Okay away from the dot at that end than the two dots that were close together. So it's, it's going away faster. It's going the same amount of time it took to stretch this thing. The two, these two dots would go a little apart, and these dot, dots at the end would go very far apart. So it's just geometry. It's ju right, it's just geometry. <laughs> great. Okay, so that's great. Thanks, Jim. So, so anyway, so, that's, so now that's the picture. That we live in this, uh, space is expanding. We're, we're making space, and that's what, if you will, drives these galaxies apart. And the galaxies are markers, and you saw there are lots of them. There are lots of markers. So let's now just, uh, now let's just put this in context of those earlier pictures of the galaxies. Okay, so at first, so now just, so f start off by ignoring the expansion of space. Okay, but except, let me just go back one second. Just say, if, if these guys are all moving apart from each other now, we can, we can turn the picture back and say, the universe has existed for a finite amount of time. Okay, so that's the key, right? Because they're expanding away. We can just imagine running the clock back and they were all on top of each other. The universe was much more compact then. And, and so, so we have a finite amount of time. So now I, I just want you to put out of your minds for a couple of slides that notion, just imagine space being fixed, okay, not expanding, but knowing that the age of the universe is finite. So we ignore the expansion, and imagine we can go anywhere right now in the universe, instantaneously. 
no matter where we went, it would look the same as it looks around us. Okay? And I've said, and you can see in the titles sort of provocatively, uh, the universe is infinite. Okay? This, isn't, this is not a mathematician's statement. This is a, an experimental physicist, like I am statement, in that we have not been able to make a measurement that distinguishes an infinite universe from, from something else. Okay. But for us, we can just think of it going on forever. Instantaneously, it looks, you know, you take that, pick that video from the Sloan, and it's just it, everywhere, everywhere in the universe looks the same. But we only have access to the diameter, roughly, approximately, when I say approximately, these are within factors of three, roughly, of the speed of light times the age of the universe. That's all we can see, right? Because we know we have a finite age, and that sets the size. And, and we, we can't know anything beyond there, because nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Right? So, so that sets our Hubble patch. We can probe a little bit out into here using various tricks, but for the most part, all we have access to is this. So when we say universe, observable universe, that's what we mean. That's why we can say there are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, right? Because we, we don't know what's going on over there. And that's what that statement means. Okay, so again, imagine it's... Imagine the universe is, imagine it's uh, not, still not expanding. And what happens is because, and this is now think back to the sun being eight light years away, eight light years away, eight light minutes away, um, the further out, telescopes are like time machines. Because the speed of light is finite, right, it takes time to propagate to us, the further out we look, the further back in time we look. Okay, so that's this. That's the concept, right? The further out we look, the further back we keep looking out. We keep looking back. The Hubble telescope. This is an image from them. Looked out to about there, and you can sort of see that's sort of the end. That's where these sort of normal galaxies stop, and there's this um, earlier state, which we'll get to in a little bit out out beyond there. Okay, so we see distant objects when they were younger. And, you can, and all, you can imagine where the, this, this is going to end up. Okay. And now I want to add the expansion back in. When we add the expansion in, the effect is just is, it's the stretching of space. What that does to all the light is it, you just think of it stretching the wavelength of light. And so something, and when you stretch the wavelength of light, you make it, you effectively make it colder. So you make something that was hot here look much colder now. And, and that's the redshift, right? That's the cosmo more precise, that's the cosmological redshift. Okay? You're just stretching these wavelengths. And so not so not only when we look back do we see things as they were younger, when we see them when, you know, at these different at these different wavelengths. Okay. Good. So now let's let me roll that together here, and this is this is a, a, a picture that uh, we often show, and this is uh, say the standard model of cosmology, and these lines, and this is uh, the, the scales are numbers. These lines are supposed to denote the expansion of space. We'll get back to that. Here are quantum fluctuations. The most, uh, I'd say, the most popular model is uh, uh, inflation, and one of its authors is here, sitting back there, uh, Paul Steinhardt, and also one of its critics, as I should say, is also Paul, Paul and Anna. The, you know, but the idea is that the quantum fluctuations um, started out; they were expanded enormous, enormously. Think of it as space being made enormously quickly and just pu pushing everything apart. That ended, and if you will, the rest of the, the Big Bang model took over. So these quantum fluctuations were expanded up to cosmic scales through this an absolutely enormous expansion. And they were, and we'll come back to this picture, they were manifest as 
fluctuations in the strength of gravity. And the matter in the early universe responding to those fluctuations, the matter and the light in the early universe responding to those fluctuations gave rise to this pattern. Okay, because, because if you have, uh, imagine you have, and, and I'll show you this a little bit more later, right, some, some landscape of, of the strength of gravity, right, where it's stronger, matter's going to collect in light, and where it's weaker, it's not. So the universe expands and cools, expands and cools, expands and cools, and then all of a sudden at this time, right here, about 380,000 years after the, oops, after the Big Bang, the universe became transparent. And that's what we call the moment of decoupling. And let me just show you how that works, and then we'll, then we'll come back to this picture. What happens is, is it expands and cools from its, from its fiery beginning. And then when the temperature of the universe is roughly about half the temperature of the sun, Hydrogen can form, right? Before it's a plasma, it's so hot, you can't form atoms. The electrons just can't glom on, you know, they just can't stick to the protons because there's so many photons around. So here are the electrons and the protons, they're all separate, they're in a plasma. And all of a sudden it cools enough, and this happens relatively quickly, that you can form atoms. So these are hydrogen atoms here with a proton and electron. And once all the electrons, which are otherwise scattering photons, once all the electrons are in atoms, they can't scatter electrons, uh, can't scatter photons anymore. And those photons are free to roam the universe. And, and that's, that's what we see. That's why, this, that's why this radiation, that's why this is such a powerful probe of the early universe. So this is called, it says, the moment of decoupling. The photons, those yellow guys, decouple from the blue guys. The electrons and atoms are formed. And so, and they, they then, they, to a first approximation, those photons don't interact with anything until we detect them in our telescopes. That's a, a true, a sort of a 90% type statement. We can get back, okay? So that's, so that's what happens. And so we look back and we really see this, this picture of what's going on in the early universe. So let me, let me try to, to roll that all together. And this is another really great, um, video from the, the Sloan team. And again, this is not the, uh, these are all, again, well, it's a little artistic license here, right? Not all galaxies look like that, but the, these are the positions of real galaxies, okay? And we're on Earth, and, and where there are no galaxies here just are, are where they haven't been measured, but you can see they're clumped, and they're in this fantastic array. And what ha what's happening is we are moving out from near us, looking out further and further in space, looking back at time. And we all know that's not there, right? They're all looking back in time in the, in to earlier and earlier phases of, of formation. These are called the, when you get out this far, this is about nine billion years after the Big Bang, There's those called luminous red galaxies right there. We keep looking out further and further away, again, looking back and back in time, and we're almost there. We keep looking out, keep looking back, and there we see the microwave background, okay? So the picture we have then, so now, then the, the way you think about it, this is the edge of the observable universe. Imprinted in this picture, this heat map of this radiation, is, are, are these seeds of the formation of cosmic structure. From here down to us, the whole, the whole picture of the formation of all the structure in the universe took place. Right? The things, these tell us the characteristics of the gravitational uh, potential, the, the gravitational landscape, and then the matter falls into it and then eventually forms things and, and here we are. And so that's, and that is the, that is the, the picture we put together. So when, when we look at this, that's what we, we think of. This, this beach ball is, again, the edge of the observable universe and a picture of the, of the, if you will, the first light, or baby picture. We have lots of phrases like that for it. Okay? Does that sound good? 
Good. Okay, now I'm going to tell you how, whoops, so nice, I want to see it again. Okay, but I'll tell you how, how we measure it because it's really, it's really straightforward. This is, this is, there's subtleties, but, there's, uh, but it, the, the measurement is conceptually straightforward. Uh, well, first, with the expansion, so we said that decoupling era happened when the universe was about half the temperature of the sun. What that means, I mean, that's good. It's plasma at half the temperature of the sun. We can calculate things really well there. So, uh, but the expansion of the universe since then, it's, it's cooled now, this radiation. The microwave background was really hot back then. That's all those photons. It's now about 2.725 degrees above absolute zero. Okay, so that's the temperature, if you will, it's the temperature of the universe. Okay? And so, and so the sun, right, is about 6,000 degrees. And it shines in, of course, visible light, right? That's why we've evolved. And so since it's about 1,000 times cooler, roughly, it shines in the microwave region because... Because the, lo because the colder something is, the longer the wavelength of light at which it predominantly emits is. So in some sense, and I know this is an age-dependent statement, um, you've, you've detected the CMB. And the way, that, the way you do it here is if you just have an old-fashioned antenna, uh, old-fashioned TV, sorry, attached to an old-fashioned antenna, and... And, that, and you just take that antenna and you tune to an inactive channel. So they say microwaves, so channel 69 is at 800 megahertz. Okay. And you just point that and you look at the fuzz on the TV. And you point that antenna around at the different parts of the sky. That, well, first off, that fuzz, about 1% of that comes from the microwave background. Okay. The rest comes from noise and the electronics in the, in the TV. About 1% of that comes from the microwave background. So now you point that antenna around at different parts of the sky and measure the change in fuzz. That's, that's what this is a measurement of, right? That's, that's what we measure. And, and so, and then you can imagine, right, these, these things, these are polarized, right? So you can take the antenna and turn it sideways. You measure polarization or not, you can do all those sorts of tricks. And, and if you look at all sh these, uh, these two satellites, uh, which are really the, the foundation of this, of this model we've been talking about, you can see this is the WMAP satellite. This is for scale, that's about one and a half meters. That looks like a TV satellite dish, right? There, there are two of them because we measure temperature differences, but that's just a TV satellite dish. Light comes in here, bounces off there, bounces off there, bounces off there. Right? This is, these are just very fancy TV receivers, okay? We, we, you know, we make them really low noise, and we make sure we know exactly where they're pointing and all that sort of thing. But there, now there are two satellites that have, have, done, have mapped, made maps like this by, by um, well, going up and, as I said, mapping the sky. There are also now... Uh, a, a number of ground-based measurements, and I'll show you some results from all of, all of these. This is the South Pole Telescope, obviously at the South Pole. This is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope in northern Chile. And this is the Polar Bear Telescope, or Simon's Array. Uh, we're neighbors, and, and I'll tell you more about that uh, in a little while. So these are all in northern Chile, and carrying on the measurements and improving, you might add, greatly. In, in some cases, the measurements made from, uh, by those satellites. So what is it then that we, that we actually, that we measure? This is now more like this map. Okay, the first one was sort of a cleaned PR image. And, uh, but this is, what, this is what it really looks like. Okay, this is the sky. So this is, said the microwave background was, was um, it, it's 2.725 Kelvin. And so you subtract the average and you look for these deviations, right, from, um, in this case, this color scale is, is blue to red is um, 300 millionths of a degree. But it, we, you subtract the average and, and look for these deviations. And, and this is what you see. What this is from is the galaxy. Okay, this was made at a wavelength of about half a centimeter. 
So this, this is the galaxy. And so you can see it's, this is our galaxy. That, that's the Milky Way. Yep. And you can see there's a lot of that's you, contamination. So what, this, what we do is we, we make a cut, a fancy cut. But you can imagine just cutting there and cutting there. And then these, all these fluctuations out here, these reds and blues, that, that is, those are the fluctuations in the temperature of the, of the microwave background, or the CMB. That is the anisotropy. That's, that's what we look at. OK. So let's now look at that a little more closely. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the Milky Way, very much in the same way that Derby picture from the COBE satellite was the, was the Milky Way earlier. OK, so let's zoom in. There's the Milky Way up there. Again, emitting that instead of in the visible in the, in, in the uh, millimeter regime. Let's zoom in on this box right here. OK, so that's uh, zoom in. This is about five degrees. Side. So you can look at that picture and just say, how, there, there are hot and cold spots. What's a typical size? They're all different sizes, right? Because it's this random field. But you can just guess a typical size. Hmm? I mean, you can, it's even the color scale, the, uh, uh, length angular scale there, right? Something like a degree. OK? This is something like a, like a degree. And, and we, can do, we can do better than that. Here's a four degree by four degree section. And just for scale, so this is actually, I made this one and centered it on the North Celestial Pole. OK, so ne next time you look up the North Star, don't think about the star. Think about this image up there around the North Star. And that's, that's the size of the full moon. Full moon doesn't get near the North Star, right? So but that's the size of the full moon for scale. Okay. If you took that whole map, this, the, this one over the whole sky, and you just took all the hot spots here, and you stacked them up, you'd get an image like that. Just take the hottest spots and you know, take them, make sure they're two degrees away from another one. Do, you, know, you come up with an algorithm and stack them, and you get a picture like that. And we'd say that's, that is the average spot size. And because there's so many spots, and they're so well measured, we can tell the diameter of this. It doesn't look like it on this plot. We can tell the diameter of that to sub-percent accuracy. It's, and I'll give you a number in a minute. It's one of the most precisely measured numbers in, in cosmology. OK, so there it is. We have this spot size. OK, and so there's, only, there's one bit of math in here. I know there are a lot of mathematicians around. The math is going to be on a triangle, so we'll have to think back to your triangles if you wouldn't. Okay, so so there's that we we measure that angle physically. What's happening? So in this mo so something led in the early universe. You know, as again, inflation is the most popular model to these quantum fluctuations that laid down eventually laid down these this gravitational landscape. And the plasma here in the early universe responds to it. Right? So here is, you can think of this as a mountain range. Right? And the plasma is flowing, is responding to gravity, like fog, you know, like fog in the mountain range. It's just rolling, it's going down into the valleys. And it goes down, it's, it's picture is, it compresses, and it gets hotter. Right? And where, it, where there isn't, so it compresses again over here, where it isn't, it's colder. And the size of this region is about, is, is a degree in angle. It is that spot size. And here's, the th here's why the micro background is so powerful. We can compute in meters per second, in meters, I should say, for size, right? It's the speed at which this plasma can move. This is, that's the plasma I showed you schematically earlier. It's the, it's the speed that the plasma travels times the age of the universe of decoupling. That gives you a length scale. That's the fundamental mode, if you will. We now, so here is, we now use this fundamental mode. It's on the sky. Here we are. Here's a hot spot. You can do the same thing with cold spots. It doesn't make any difference. Here it is. We look at it. 
We now know this angular scale incredibly accurately. At least this number is from Planck. We know the physical scale because this is not hard physics, right? This is physics of a few thousand degrees, half the temperature of the sun, right? So we can compute it really well. Okay, so we know the angle, we know the size, therefore we know the distance to it. Okay? And from the standard yardstick, we get the distance, and since we know the speed of light, we can deduce the age. And there it is, 13.8 billion years old. So if we live in a cyclic universe, that would be the age of this cycle. Okay? And who, who knows, right? We don't, that's certainly a possibility there. Okay, so we can do a little better than that. Um, this was on the front page, of the new, earlier version was on the front page of the New York Times, so I think it's safe to show. Uh, the, uh, this is now, and I want to get across, let's not, here's angular scale on the top, right? So that is that first peak. There's a lot more detail in here than I showed you. On the y-axis is what we call the variance, or the amount of fluctuation power. This is for those in the know, this is just the angular power spectrum. This is the amount of fluctuation power versus angular scale. That's the position of the first peak. What I really want you to take away from this is less the details, but more that these are error bars, and this is a model. And, and, the, and this is why we believe our models. If, if this is a model with six parameters, but if you don't have a cosmological model that fits these data, it's not a contender, right? That's, that's why, that's what's changed in the past, say, 15 or 20 years, is we can make these really precise measurements. Okay, so what are the parameters? Uh, roughly this. So this model agrees, uh, the total model is six parameters, so let me not worry about the other ones. We'll just focus on a couple of them. But it agrees with, 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 with really all, with all cosmological measurements, with, with some minor tensions that we're discovering, but we'll, who knows where they'll go. Here it is, here's the model. We, the stuff of which we're made, is just roughly 5%. There's another form of matter. We have no idea what it is. But we know it has to be matter. We know it has to be something you can put on a scale and weigh. And we can tell that from that, that model, but we don't know what it is. There are searches going on around the, uh, around the world for it. And then there's the cosmological constant, and if we don't know what that is, we really don't know what that is. Right? It is, uh, who knows? It is, I'll uh, just have some comments. So this, this model's fantastic, right? You saw the fit. Just six parameters. We fit, uh, we fit millions of data points, and not just from the microwave background, from surveys of galaxies, from, from calculations of uh, you know, nucleosynthesis-based calculations. But here it is. You know, so this dark energy, or cosmological constant, it, it can't be predicted by any fundamental theory in physics. Right? It is an, an add-on. We don't know why it's there. Uh, it's as though the vacuum has an energy density associated with it, so it drives the universe apart. It means that, uh, it means in the future, if you think about making, s if this making space picture, space will be made at an accelerated rate, okay? And I most feel it's a missing piece of the theory, right? There's something deep we don't understand as opposed to a substance. And, and we really, we don't know what the dark matter is, although the, the searches are fantastic. Okay, so uh, what is the abbreviated standard model? At some very early time, a quantum field was impressed on the universe, impressed on the universe a gravitational landscape. And we measure the characteristics of this. So this is a picture of a quantum field uh, from the birth of the universe. Which is, right, this is, if you could look up at your TV and move it around, this is what you would, TV antenna, you'd see this. The matter fell into these valleys <coughs> to form all the structure, but only a sixth of that matter is familiar to us. And now the dynamics of the universe isn't driven by the matter. The matter is going to become irrelevant. The dynamics of the universe is driven by this cosmological constant, the expansion. Okay, so let me, I want to, let me end up here with um, uh, a frontier. So this, is, this model is, I mean, it's really, it's fantastic. And as I, I just want to emphasize again, it's not... You can look at it, you can look at a universe nearby, you can look at it far away, you can look at it in, in my county galaxies. 
you get the same basic answer, right? This is, we really know something about the universe on its largest scales. So one of the frontiers, are there other elements to the model? And of course there have to be. One of the most exciting ones, at least for me, is are there gravitational waves from the birth of the universe? And first off, what is a gravitational wave? And the way to, to, to think about a gravitational wave, it is, a, it is a, a squeezing of space this way and a stretching of space this way and a cycle later squeezing this way and stretching this way. And it is a wave that's propagating that's deforming space okay, as it propagates. Okay, and we measure it in, a st in strain. So here's, so uh, look at, here, I'll shorten this. So here's about a meter. A strain is if, if a gravitational wave went by this and shortened it by a centimeter, we would say the strain, the change in length over length, is a percent, 0.01. Okay, so that's a strain. So gravitational waves, because they, they stretch and expand and stretch and expand, they're measured in strain. So you may have heard that the LIGO, uh, the, the LIGO detector, LIGO observatory, discovered two inspiraling black holes that emitted gravitational waves as they coalesced. Right? This was a huge discovery. And the strain here, these, this, is just gives, this is just a testament to the experimental ingenuity, and, and David mentioned it, uh, Ray Weiss. The strain is a part in, that's one with 21 zeros. Okay, tiny, one part in 10 to the 21. That was the strain they measured on Earth. And to put it in human terms, almost human terms, that corresponds to the distance of measuring one human hair between us and the closest star. Okay, that's, that's what that measurement was. That's why it's so amazing, right? These waves oscillated at 100 cycles per second. So we're searching for gravitational waves produced from the extraordinary densities at the, at the birth of the universe. And I should say, you know, we, we don't know, A, if they exist or if they exist at measurable levels. But here's the thing. Their strains could be as large as that, huge by gravitational wave standards, right? This corresponds to the width of a hair roughly compared to the height of a person. So these are large strains. But they oscillate, it's not like they're passing through us now, right? They oscillate at sort of hundreds of cycles, not per second, but per age of the universe. Right? So the way to think about them is thinking about this, is these are, these are strains that, that perturb this surface of last scattering, okay? We can think about them as sort of as dimples in the surface that we're trying to measure. Uh, dimples of a part in, in 100,000. So this would be a, a new connection found between, between gravitation and quantum mechanical processes and a fantastic test for our, our cosmological model. You know, as, uh, for example, I mean, yeah, I should say, uh, you know, Paul... 20 years ago said they should be this big, and then I've, in the recent models that he and Anna have been working on, they, they don't exist at measurable levels, to give you an idea, right? These are two separate possible cosmologies, and this sort of measurement can distinguish them. So how are we going to do this? What we do is we're going to measure, and, and people are measuring, polarization in the microwave background. Even though the strain affects all aspects of the microwave background, it's most distinctive in the polarization. <laughs> and to give you an idea of the scale, so this is about 36 full moons across, but the, is, the, is the idea is the microwave background is polarized. So if you took this image, this globe here, and you could look at it in microwave polarized glasses and turn them, and just, you know, just like you look at your car hood in polarized glasses, and turn them, that image would change. You see a different image when you turn it. Okay. That's what these arrows are supposed to indicate, the direction of polarization. And, and it is a very particular way it changes, and that's what we're trying to see. 
and the corresponding temperature of them is about a hundred billionths of a degree. Okay, so we're, that's the signal we're trying to get at. Uh, here, down here. That one's the temperature. Temperature, sorry, temperature is 100 millionths. Yeah, one form of the polarization is six millionths. What we're going after is hundreds of billionths of a degree RMS. Yeah. To give you an idea, now I'll just bring you up to the state of the field. So this gets a little more technical. So this is now, these are, these are all measurements in the past few years. So that, that spectrum I showed you earlier was what we ended up with at the end of, of W map. And I should say that line through it is David's. Um, and this is, this is where we are now. So that earlier plot I showed you, that one on the New York Times, is that line right there. And now you can see this has been measured. It's been measured now really well by, by at least four experiments. The CMB is polarized, quote, the E mode polarization. We measure that now with exquisite accuracy. We're looking for this other form of polarization, and let me not get into the details, but it's been down here. We're starting to measure it. If these gravitational waves exist, they live way down here, okay? At, at, a, at a huge, at, at a, this really tiny, tiny level. And we're looking for this signature. So how are we doing it? Well, one way is with the Simons Observatory. <laughs> And so this is in progress, this is happening. Uh, the director is Brian Keating, the spokespersons will be M Mark Devlin, Adrian Lee, and Suzanne Staggs, and rotating, this is now a large uh, collaboration. And, and, here's, and, uh, and here's where, so we're doing it. Anyway, here's, here's where it is. It's down in uh, uh, northern Chile. Let me see if I can get this video going. And this is where we've made a number of these measurements. And here we go, zooming up. And this is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope here. And this is all now, we, we make these measurements from an altitude, this is about 17,000 feet. We go up there to get above the water vapor uh, in the atmosphere. These are, this, is a tele this is a class telescope from colleagues at, uh, of actually both Dave Spurgles and mine at Johns Hopkins. And, and this is the Simons Array, distinct from the Simons Observatory, which is also currently taking data. And the idea is that we are, with uh, su the support of the Simons Foundation, going to have another telescope the size of, of ACT, roughly right here. Plans are underway. And then a series of smaller telescopes targeted at going after these primordial gravitational waves. Okay, so they'll be, they'll, they're just, we're going to take this last curve and, um, these error bars, they're just, they're, we'll see over the next decade, they're all just going to shrink away, tiny amounts. Hmm? I'm sorry, this is, look at, yes, let, here, let me go back to, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is, that was the most technical. Okay, so think of this one. That's that compressional scale at, two, at one degree, okay? And, and, and this is two degrees and 90 degrees out here at the largest angular scale, and then, Small angular scales the other way. Okay, what is what is a multipole moment? That is um, was the easiest way to describe it. I can tell you what what uh, of L of one is. That's if you take the sphere and you squish it. That corresponds to a temperature pattern like that. L of two is you squish it in two ways. L of three in three ways. L of four in four ways. So that's the bottom axis. So then you imagine little dimples at those angular scales. Okay, but here's, but going, um, yikes. So all these error bars will shrink and we'll just have this full complete picture. So that's, that's where we're headed. So we stop there. Thank you.
Uh, and, <laughs> and I also just want to say a special thanks. So as David mentioned, I've been here on sabbatical, so and, and uh, uh, a few days a week, and it's a special. It's, it's great to be able to thank <laughs> thank Jim and Marilyn for making that possible and just housing me for all these all these weeks. It's been a wonderful experience. So again, thank you all.